to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to call this, How Was Your Summer? How was your summer? If it was like most people in Minnesota, it was too short and too busy. Trying to put 30 pounds of summer into a five-pound can. But how was your summer spiritually speaking? Was it a spiritually profitable summer? Was it a summer of spiritual progression or carnal retrogression? Did it draw you closer to the Lord or farther from him? And frankly, this is something we all need to ask ourselves, including myself. For while the Christian life is a moment-by-moment walk of faith, one step at a time, it's also a race in which those steps are grouped together to develop a certain pattern and direction to your life. And as much as I like our summers, in some ways, I'm always glad when they are over. And Bible season begins again for some people. And the local church gathers again as we normally do the rest of the year. I say that because it's easy to lose sight of what really matters in light of eternity, Jesus Christ, the Word of God, and people. And any time of the year, but it can be especially true in the busyness of summer. You see, the tyranny of the urgent blurs our eternal perspective, and oftentimes we make choices that really don't honor the Lord ultimately and value his word. On the one hand, one may be very, very busy with things that aren't wrong in themselves, but are they eternally profitable? On the other hand, your summer may have been involving a a walk of faith and and service and sacrifice to the Lord and others in various kinds of ministry opportunities that you've had. You know, I'm reminded of Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you've shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister and Only eternity in the judgment seat of Christ will really show what was done this summer. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm all for family times and activities during the summer. They should be very important in our lives, and we just had a family vacation ourselves. But even when it comes to this, if we're not careful, it can become out of balance. In addition, I usually try to take in at least one Twins game a a summer and maybe even get some fishing in if I can. But even then, I seek to use those as opportunities to build relationships and times of fellowship or maybe even evangelism. It's like all of life. It's an issue of priority and focus. For we always tend to take time for what we deem important and truly love or value. And that's why our Lord Jesus Christ said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what is it we treasure? And what should be our priority? Well, he reminds us in the same passage, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now here's a helpful saying that as your pastor, I would like for you to mentally mull around here for a while in the next week two weeks, three weeks, indefinitely? In light of eternity, what is really important? And how does God want me to think about this? In light of eternity, what is really important? How does God want me to think about this? Now notice the phrases here. In light of eternity, not in time, an eternal perspective, what is really important and not incidental or trivial? And how does God, not ourselves or others, want me to think about this? As the Christian life primarily goes on between your ears. And once you turn off your brain 
and you go by your feelings, you are doomed to fail, you are doomed to misfocus, you are doomed to walk by sight and not by fate. And so are you living in light of eternity? Are you factoring into your priorities and thinking what God says really matters in light of eternity? You see, the legalist misses this as he focuses on the externals, not the internals or the eternals. You see, in light of eternity, what is really important and how does God want me to think about this. Now, the license-oriented believer misses this as well. As he is so consumed with his exercise of liberty that if the Bible doesn't specifically say something is sin, he feels free to indulge in it, even if it's unwise to do and is worthless in light, in light of eternity. So how was your summer spiritually? You say, but pastor, you don't know the trials I've been going through. I have a right to complain. I have a right to whine. I have a right to have a self-absorbed pity party with me, myself, and I, kissing myself in the mirror. I mean, maybe that's how you're thinking. We don't usually articulate it that clearly, but I can tell you this. When we're going through trials, it's really easy to be self-focused. On the other hand, those are the very things that God wants to use to get your attention and to draw you closer to him and to have you pass the test of faith. And indeed, your trial may be very, very difficult. And frankly, I do care about you and, and how it's going. But I also know from the word of God some truths. And you should be turned to 2 Corinthians 4. And let me call your attention to verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing. Did you hear that? Have you noticed? Have you looked at a picture from 20 years ago? <laughs> Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. That's not automatic, but that's what can happen. For our light affliction. Can you repeat that? You mean after all that Paul was going through for our light affliction, which is but for a moment temporarily, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while something is going on. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, we're walking by faith and not by sight. We're thinking in light of eternity what really matters and how does the Lord want us to think. You know, I think of even the trials with my eyes this summer that are still going on. I don't want to lose my vision. Obviously, I need it. Vision is very important. But it's, in light of eternity, a light affliction. What we just have gone through with Sarah is a light affliction. As I think of Jim Lynchide's home going, all difficult trials, and yet Paul calls them a light affliction. I think of Hurricane Dorian going on and the devastation. But what a reminder of what really matters. It's not houses and things and cars. It's Jesus Christ, the word of God, and people. For reality is your life is a vapor, and it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. You see, you are one heartbeat away from going to be with the Lord, either by death or by rapture. And as a result, our prayer should be, even so come, Lord Jesus, as this could happen at any time. For indeed, you have an appointment with the Lord as a believer. And you see, your times are in the Lord's hands, and the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength there are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. And then what will really matter? Now here's a verse I'd like you to jot down the reference, and I'd like to encourage you to think about this verse. This is a verse that has really struck me recently that I really appreciate it. It's 
John 17, verse 24. The Lord Jesus prayed this in the upper room discourse, and he's praying to his Father in the true Lord's Prayer. And this is what he says. Father, I desire that they, namely believers in Christ, also whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. And by the way, where is he today? In heaven. Why do you want them in heaven? That they may behold my glory with which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now this is pretty incredible because we know the Father answers the Lord Jesus' prayer. And that one day as a believer you're going to be with the Lord. But did you realize he wants you there? Not only do we say, even so come Lord Jesus, but Lord, the Lord Jesus is saying, I want you to come home. I'm waiting for you to come home so that you can behold my glory, who I am, and all my Shekinah glory, as it were. Because I'm the one who loved you. I'm the one who saved you. You belong to me. Pretty incredible. Now, that does not again, preclude the fact that there are many trials and difficulties we face in life. In fact, as I think of that, I think of Johnny Erickson Tata. Many of you know her. She's very well known. She, as a teenager, was involved in a diving accident in which she became a quadriplegic. And yet, through that difficulty, the Lord has matured her and used her. And while I don't agree with everything she says, she says a lot of really good things. And even as I think of the trials of this life and one day going home, she has stated, if you have never known physical pain in your life, how could you appreciate the nail-scarred hands with which Jesus Christ will meet you? It's a glorious thing to know that your Father God makes no mistakes in directing or permitting that which crosses the path of your life. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is our glory to trust him no matter what. Real satisfaction comes not in understanding God's motives, but in understanding his character, in trusting his promises, and in leaning on him and resting in him as the sovereign who knows what he is doing and does all things God is more concerned with conforming me to the likeness of his son than leaving me in my comfort zones. God is more interested in inward qualities than outward circumstances. Things like refining my faith, humbling my heart, cleaning up my thought life, and strengthening my character. Lastly, a last quote, what an encouragement to realize that God has reserved you and me for a special task in his great work, in his hands, we're not only useful, but priceless. You know, as we think of our home being in heaven, we're reminded that we are simply ambassadors for Christ, that God is seeking to use to preach the gospel. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And he's given us the word or message of reconciliation. And it's all about what he did for us at the cross. As the Lord Jesus died that we might live. And that is why God has entrusted to us the gospel. And he wants us to live our lives in light of eternity. Of what really matters. And as a result, he wants to refine our faith. And even prepare us to go home to be with him. You know, it's like the guy who who showed Charles Spurgeon years ago around a castle that he owned. And Spurgeon didn't say anything until the end. And the guy said, well, Dr. Spurgeon, what do you think of my place? And he goes, makes it kind of hard to die. And frankly, if everything was rosy in life, it'd make it kind of hard to die. You know, one quote I couldn't find by Johnny Erickson Tata, but I've heard of it. Someone said, won't it be great one day, Johnny, when you finally get a new body and you're in heaven and all of this? And she says, yes, I said, no, no. What will be great 
is that I will be able to worship God unfettered by a sin nature. So true. So dear friends, in the meantime, we're just sojourners. We're strangers down here. We don't fit. And we're pilgrims. This isn't our home. For our citizenship is in heaven. And so we're to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. We're not only to be a witness by our lip in preaching the gospel, but by our lives, living holy lives, having our conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And yet all of us have had our failures, and all of us have had our fumbles, some to a greater extent than others. But you're still breathing air. And as I will share, beginning this Sunday, as we begin the study of the book of Esther, God still has you here for such a time as this. God still has a plan for your life. God still wants you to live in light of eternity. He wants you to redeem the time. The opportunities of the past are gone. Whether captured or lost, they're gone. But you have today, and you have every other day from this point forward, in which you can redeem the time. For the days are evil and the days are short. And so we're to be praying, praying for others, praying for those preaching the gospel, praying for one another, that God would open to us a door for the word, the word of the gospel, to speak the mystery of Christ, which I'm also in chains that I may make it manifest or clear as I ought to speak. We're to walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. I end where we began, in light of eternity. What's really important? And how does God want me to think? So how was your summer? Or maybe I should ask, how will your fall be? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for tonight and the privilege of hearing these testimonies, of reviewing these events that you undertook in, and even reading these verses that remind us that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we are looking not at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. And we know that one of the things that are not seen is our home in heaven and how we can live in light of that. And one day knowing we're going home because we've been saved by your grace. We've been redeemed through Christ's blood. We put our trust in him to save us from a hell we deserve to a heaven we don't. And you've given us not only forgiveness, but purpose and meaning in life and the opportunity to have fellowship with you each and every day as we enjoy this eternal relationship we have with you by your incredible and amazing grace. We're thankful even that when we're not faithful, yet you abide faithful. You cannot deny yourself. Thank you that you're giving us grace to breathe tonight you still have a plan. You want our fellowship. We have today to enjoy, tomorrow to redeem. And indeed, may our walk of faith string into a race of certain patterns and directions that bring honor and glory to our Savior, as well as great satisfaction to our own souls. So we thank you for all of that. We commit this all to you. In Jesus' name.